Our next speaker is also someone who has been very instrumental in the whole field of keeping space right in the forefront of, of the public and um, on the edge. We're very pleased to have with us um, Dr. Lewis Friedman, who is Director Emeritus of the Planetary Society, but he's also the co-founder of the Planetary Society along with, with Carl Sagan. And he is going to... I, I have all these long backgrounds, and so I hate to spend the time talking about them because I want to talk with people first. But he has worked both in policy areas with space exploration as well as doing literally actually building and working on spacecraft. And what he's going to talk to us today is about nanosets, solar cells, as precursors, interstellar precursors. You probably notice a theme in this section. And this is talking about some of the technology and those kinds of challenges that we think of. And we're going to be able to go back a little bit later and really talk about how these things really affect our world today and be able to move further from there. So, Dr. Friedman. My name is spelled wrong. First complaint. <laughs> I didn't write that no. one. No. <laughs> you did everything else. That's all right. um, thank you very much. Uh, and I hope to represent small thinking here. Uh, these other, many other thoughts here are, are very large. And I want to talk about, I think, things we can do within the next hundred years that actually make us travel the path toward interstellar flight. I'm not daunted by 100 years or 200 years. It was 310 years from the time that Galileo and Copernicus gave us a different view of ourselves and our place in our solar system and in our universe uh, to the time we started doing spaceflight. And, but in between, there were many great milestones on the road to spaceflight in mathematics and physics and in engineering. And, uh, and I think that the fact that interstellar flight, maybe hundreds of years away at actual practical implementation, doesn't mean we just sit around and wait for the technology. There'll be many practical applications and, and things that we do that will cause great excitement, great rewards, great adventures. And I think we can do that by thinking small, and that's what brought me into this. I'm a mission analyst by, by, by nature. I like to actually work on missions that we can do. Uh, and two enabling technologies, I think, have opened up a world of missions to start thinking about. One is nanosets. Those are spacecraft that are less than 10 kilograms in size. First, they were being built as student projects in universities, and now they're getting into the space agencies because of the advanced sensors and, and, and electronics that we could put on it and turning out to be very capable vehicles able to do full-scale missions of their own. Uh, there are a class of spacecraft called small sats, and uh, spacecraft will get smaller, just like our phones and our uh, uh, other electronics have gotten smaller. And uh, the future is moving down into the 100 kilogram spacecraft range, the 10 kilogram spacecraft range, and even there are people in the te technology field working on picosats to the 1 kilogram range. And the other technology is solar sailing. It's generally acknowledged, there's some controversy, but it's generally acknowledged that if we, the only practical propulsion system we know that can take us to the stars is light sailing, sailing on a beam of light. All other forms of known technology require some carrying our own fuel, and over the vast distances of space, that becomes an enor uh, too big a burden. And so, but on light sails, we use solar sailing in our solar system, and we use laser, large laser stations, large laser power sources to uh, construct lasers in our solar system that can focus light over almost interstellar distances and propel spacecraft to the stars. So that's the general idea that this is the technology that someday will take us to the stars. We're still centuries away, or at least more than a century, because of that large laser sail requirement. So what can we do with the sunlight? Well, it turns out through tricks of astrodynamics that I'll mention, we can actually achieve enormous velocities 
getting out of our solar system right now, faster than Voyager, uh, tens of astronomical units per year. It's not enough to get us to the stars, but it's enough to take us on the path that will someday get us there. So those are the two enabling ideas that I think have uh, uh, allow us to start thinking of missions that put us on the path to interstellar flight, which is page down. There it is. So let me first start out with where is solar sailing now. When I first started thinking about this subject, there hadn't been any flights of solar sails. Now there's been several. Uh, the Japanese have achieved not only the first solar sail flight, but a flight in interplanetary space. I think it's a great, you know, sails like to get out of, those of you who are sailors know that you don't like to sail in harbors, you want to get out into the ocean. Same with solar sailing, you don't want to go around and orbit around the planet, it's very inefficient. You want to get out into interplanetary space. And the Japanese have actually piggybacked on a mission that was going to Venus and flew a solar sail vehicle. So in the upper left-hand corner, uh, you see their uh, artist concept of their solar sail. In the center upper picture, you actually see a photograph they took from a flea free-flying camera they had on their, uh, deployed from their spacecraft and looked at the solar sail. We at the Planetary Society have been interested in solar sailing, again, for mission enablement of the future, and uh, we tried to fly on a, uh, a piggyback on a Russian mission uh, to, in an effort called Cosmos One. Unfortunately, getting off the Earth was uh, too difficult, and our rocket launch vehicle failed. Uh, and we're, b we're building a, uh, another concept called the light sail uh, as a, with a nanosatellite. This was actually uh, invented by NASA uh, as a nanosail, but they've never flown it above the atmosphere. We were trying to fly it a first time above the atmosphere outside of the Earth's regime so that it could fly on pure light pressure. In the lower left corner, you see an engineering model of the spacecraft with its full-scale uh, sail deployed. Now that looks small, it is. The spacecraft only weighs five kilograms. The area is 32 by 32 meters, uh, which is not inconsiderable. And the acceleration that that spacecraft have is much larger than the Japanese spacecraft and indeed larger than any spacecraft that has been developed so far for uh, a solar sailing spacecraft. Uh, but NASA is taking the technology to the next step and they actually have a flight scheduled in 2014 called Sunjammer, uh, and it will be a larger sail with a heavier spacecraft, uh, but will advance the technology for taking sails into interplanetary space. So I think we can safely say solar sailing has, his time has finally come. Now, the astrodynamics trick that I want to mention is that we learned quite a few years ago, in the early years of the space age, about using gravity as a gravity assist uh, as a way of extending our missions to higher speeds and further distances. We also know from the basic laws of celestial mechanics, one of those milestones I mentioned about the, the 19th century before the space age, that the most efficient place to apply your velocity increment is at close to the perigee. And, you're close, and so if you can lower your perigee as much as possible and apply a velocity change there, it's the way to get your uh, uh, maximum velocity effect on the size of your orbit and ultimately on the size of escaping uh, the solar system. So the solar sail trajectory actually flies outward a little bit, flies in close to the sun, and and as close as we could possibly get. In theory, it could be zero distance if we had the materials that could tolerate that. Of course, we can't. But you want to get as close as possible to the sun uh, and not burn up and keep the solar power behind you at all points so that you increase uh, your velocity to higher and higher speeds and, uh, and escape the solar system. Um, by doing that, this is a, a graph that uh, has two lines on it, but the only important one is the upper line, the red line. Um, the other one is about uh, getting out of the solar system with conventional ballistic trajectories. And the, um, uh, but this tells you uh, as a function of uh, area to mass ratio, you want as large an area solar sail with as small a mass of spacecraft to get the maximum acceleration. And 
uh, versus uh, 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 escape speed, uh, how to get up to uh, higher and higher sp state, uh, escape speeds. So 100 kilo kilometers per second, which you can see on the left axis, um, is 20 AU per year, and uh, we haven't achieved that yet, but that's a kind of the steps that we want to get to in order to conduct interstellar precursor missions. What might be our interim milestones? Well, in the solar system we have Neptune, uh, and we've achieved that distance already. That's only 30 AU from the sun. Um, the Kuiper Belt, which is the uh, uh, set of objects which include Pluto and beyond, uh, is between 50 and 500 AU, roughly speaking. Uh, we're going, we have a spacecraft now going to the Kuiper Belt. That's a New Horizons spacecraft. Uh, so, but it's only going to get to 40 or 50 AU. That's its, its mission goal. It will get further, but maybe it won't last that long. We have reached the heliopause. Voyager is now uh, uh, on its way out there. It's taken a long time, but 150 AU is, is reachable. The next milestone might be this idea of the solar gravity lens focus. Um, it's a result of Einstein's theory of general relativity and the predicting of bending of light that we know when starlight goes is bent by the, the sun, it will have a focus. And uh, the focus if, uh, for such starlight might be 600, well, we say 500 AU here, but because of solar corona effects and dynamical instabilities, it's more like six or 700 AU away. So I tend to think of that mission goal as 700 to 1,000 AU. 1,000 AU got studied by JPL as just a numerical milestone. Uh, the Oort cloud, where comets are born, is, uh, begins to be a little further than that, and uh, you're talking about 5,000 to 50,000 AU. But still, compared to uh, interstellar flight, we're a long way. This tells you how far that one light year is 63,000 AU, and Alpha Centauri is more like 250,000 AU, and that's the nearest star. So I claim that we can start to do the interstellar precursors, perhaps out to 1,000 AU in the time scale of 100 years, but maybe not to get to the interstellar flight until the next 100 years. This graph, uh, which I won't spend too much time on, just shows how far we can reach in 50 years if we can achieve a solar perihelion of 0.15 AU. That's half the distance of Mercury's, so it's quite close to the sun. We'll have to have some good materials to withstand the heat there, but it's generally considered within our technological, technological range. Uh, to reach those distances and says we can get out to the, uh, to perhaps uh, the solar gravity lens focus and perhaps even out to the Oort cloud. Um, this uh, is a list of our current spacecraft. I've mentioned the first few of them already and it tells you what kind of accelerations they're achieving and then begins to hint at what kind of accelerations we need to achieve to, uh, to get beyond. Again, these are technology technological developments we can do as long as we can continue to devise reliable, useful spacecraft at the, in the uh, kilogram size. And my view is if we can do that, this opens it up to many nations to participate, student groups to participate. You send multiple spacecraft, they don't all have to work. Everybody can contribute a little bit of the technical development, uh, maybe one purpose experiments on each. And so I see a light sailing starship architecture uh, being developed uh, that indeed uh, allows modest advances uh, by many contributors. I won't try to read all the words on these slides, but it just says that uh, uh, many people can participate. Uh, we could see uh, groups developing uh, both sensors that work. Uh, long duration flight. One of the great unsolved problems is communication distance, learning how to use power with um, perhaps milliwatts of power in a spacecraft uh, with a very low data rate over long periods of time to send data back. Um, these are the kind of technical advances and of course they will greatly advance many other things we're doing in space besides putting us on the interstellar path. And so um, uh, we can start I think now to uh, think small and take some steps uh, on our way to the uh, on the way to the stars. Thank you. Thank you.